This podcast is brought to you by the Deluxe Edition Network. To find more great shows on our network, head over to the Dan Dot Show. So take a second, subscribe, hit the thumbs up. If you want to hit the notification bell, you go ahead and do that. If not, I'm okay with that. But if you subscribe and hit the thumbs up, that helps us out a lot. If you're listening to us on iTunes, give us a like and uh, leave a review. If you think we suck, tell us we suck, but make it a five-star you suck. Because that's the only thing that helps. Hold on, stop. Welcome back to the shit show 2.0. Okay, boomer. Damn millennials. Wow. <laughs> Did not know that. Even flirters who who are obviously mentally ill. You want to be my wife? Oh, this is gonna go downhill real quick. <laughs> What is going on, and welcome to Take On The World with Johnny E. Jump Ahead, Jonas Interruptus, and Mike D. Uh, we're in, we should be in November now, when this airs. When this one airs. Yeah, 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 you're right. Uh, because we we did a, a series of horror movie backstories. Horror flicks. Um, we just recorded one, and uh, it was Candyman, which was it's a short one. The Candyman can. So go back and watch that. Listen to that. Um, we're drinking extremely bitter beer here. Yeah, enough with the bitterness, people. Come on. I mean, this one's not too bad. It's not horrible. It's just it's a weird taste. This is Bucking Birch, Long Yard Brewing. Cane style ale. I didn't know what a cane style ale was, so I gave it a try because it's on the discount rack. So we're not actually doing a review oh, of this one. Oh, oh, I get it. What? Brewed in Cane, Pennsylvania. Oh. Oh, so you know what? I- I'm going to tell you what this is. I'm going to tell you exactly what this is. This is what they call a picnic beer. Okay. Where if you're at a picnic, there's usually a keg of beer. And a keg of birch beer in this area. And you get half a cup of beer, half a cup of birch beer. Really? And it's a called picnic. Them? It's called a picnic beer. Uh, I've never known this. Well, that's a, it's a skook thing, I think. We need to try this. I've tried it. I, I Actually, depending on what the, the beer base is, it's not bad. I usually do it three quarters to a quarter. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, when we were kids, we did it because we were hiding the fact that we had beer. Right. And. Oh, they knew. They knew. Oh, I'm sure they did. Like, looking back? Yeah. Because I'm always watching the kids at the keg. It's like fucking Miller Lite, though. You can <laughs> probably drink a whole keg to yourself and be fine. <laughs> tell you this is actually kind of growing on me. That, that story, I was uh, probably, I don't know, 16 or 17. And my mom had a party or something, and she she left a, a case of, I don't know, I think it was a case. It might have been a keg. I don't know, whatever. It was uh, Coors Light. And, it's probably a party ball. <laughs> and uh, I freaking, I think it was a case, and I drank the entire case. And I did get drunk. Well, I proceeded to go outside and mow the grass. Drunk? Yeah, and uh, I set the lawnmower on fire by accident. <laughs> I tried to dump the gas in it, and I missed, and it, it filled up in like that little, you know, that yeah. groove in the bottom there. And I was like, Wah! and I started it up, and <laughs> I, I think if you had been my kid, I would have beat you a lot. <laughs> Probably all the stories you tell me, dude, I would have kicked your ass. <clears throat> yeah, I was a, uh, I was a fucking. I, I still am. I haven't changed. I'm a little more wise, but, uh... Okay. <laughs> I just do more adult stupid shit. Anyways. So what do you got for a topic, bro? Um... I have something I think a lot of people would be interested in. Um, 
I, I don't know what made me think of this. And I want to preface this by saying that Johnny did all the research for this one. Yeah. I did. I, I pulled a Johnny this week and did this not is research it. Two days worth of research. Well, two Johnny days worth of research. And uh, now I'm not going to go into super, super detail because we don't have the funding for that and I don't have the. Like, it's just, there's so many. Uh, little nooks and crannies that you could touch on and go into, but I'm just going to give you the background of these stories, and those stories are going to be about slave rebellions pertaining to specifically the United States of America. So I was interested, uh, you know, this fucking world's on fire right now. There's so many things fucked up with this world. A lot of racial tensions going on. And I, I watched a bit of this movie the other day. It was called Dinner with Andre. Old, like, 70s movie. And um, it's kind of like a Orwellian, you know, 1982 kind of thing. And the guy's, the guy's talking about how <clears throat> he's... I forgot the fucking thing, but, and I wrote it down. But it's really interesting, and he says, you know, have, have you ever noticed the amount of people that say they want to leave New York City but never do? The guy's like, yeah, I don't know. But it basically goes on a, that they have figured out that why enslave these people when we can just have them build the prison themselves, be proud of it, and never want to leave? Boom, and it's, it's in a nutshell, basically. Okay. And it's like, you know, holy shit. Like, when you think about it, it's like, wow, like, is that true? Like, but anyways, um, I, really, I wish I had the fucking quote. Well, you know, parts of our old jail were built, built by inmates. Right, yeah. But they're saying, like, they were relating as, like, New York City in its entirety is a prison. Okay. Because Escape from New York. No. Oh. But, uh, so I, I really wish I had the fucking quote here, but I forgot it. So, if you want the full thing, just go on YouTube, uh, check out Dinner with Andre. And um, the guy from uh, Inconceivable, that's uh, one of the guys in it. He's at the table with Andre, or he might even be Andre, I'm not sure. But uh, So then I got to thinking, I'm like, well, you know, as fucked up as the slave shit was, and you know, we wish it never fucking happened, it did, we have to deal with it. And... You know, that's something you don't ever want to forget. But then I was thinking, you know, did, you don't ever hear of, like, did this, did, were there ever any rebellions? Did they, they say, you know what? Fuck you, white motherfuckers. I've had enough of this shit. And, uh, you know, rise up and kill a couple folks. And now, let me, I'm going to jump in. And it, it's Mike Jump Ahead. And you can correct me through your research, but a video that I watched showed only. One slave rebellion on American soil was successful. Um, that, that's that's and this was a video done, um, and and he was talking about slave rebellions and not just one in the United States, but um, he talked about the Amistad, okay. which which was open water, and I've actually you ever see the movie, no. Le, Le Amistad? No, dude, if you get a chance, take a time and watch that movie. <clears throat> It was slaves on a ship being brought here, uh, over through the ship. Okay. And they were tried in, I think it was a New York court, uh, for mutiny. On the ship. On the ship. Um, and they eventually won and got sent back to where they were stolen from in Africa. No shit. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. Le Amistad. And that was... Colonial, like Americans, uh, but uh, it might be pre-America. It might be before. Yeah, the was... French, British. I think the French were the originals, then the British, and then uh, what was you know us. Well, the Amistad, America. I guess, is a French ship. Le Amistad. Yes, I would think that sounds French. So let me read this little. Uh, the guy starts it off with saying this, and I just. I wish I could do it in his voice, but, you know, this, this really makes it feel somber. And 19th century, sorry. Jump uh, uh, okay, no problem. 
<clears throat> so it was 1839. So yeah, they were. So it was it La Amistad on their way to colonial America, probably most likely. It was a Spaniard ship. So he, ahead, s- just... he says, uh, "Robbing us, robbing us of our history, culture, language, and identity, the ripping apart of family units and royal bloodlines." The absolute and complete torment of our fathers and mothers before us. And that was him referring to the Middle Passage, which was the journey from Africa to America and the conditions in which the slaves lived. Now, they weren't on, they were crammed in there, shackled down, laying on their backs. Yeah, they laid them on their backs so they could get more slaves on the ship. Yeah, and they were just lined up shoulder to shoulder all the way around. The and stacked. And stacked. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of them died on the way over. Yeah. And, uh, and when if they died on the ship on the way over, they just threw them overboard. Yeah. It was like just terrible. Throwing cargo. I mean, it, it, it's disgusting. I, 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 I don't like thinking about shit like this, but I think when, it, it, when, when you do a topic like this, it makes people think, hey, you know. Let's not repeat history. Yeah. Let's not forget it. And I'm a strong believer in looking at history so you don't repeat the mistakes of the past because we all know history is bound to repeat itself and um damn it fuck was i gonna say anyways um go ahead i need a second okay so rebellion i guess in its most pure form is quote against tyranny and oppression um Apparently, there have been countless rebellions, but some are lost due to poor record keeping. There is um, one, and I don't know much on it. It was called Evil Landing, and I guess this took place in Africa somewhere. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. The, some of the slaves headed to the mountains. Some took up arms, and some decided to commit suicide. So they rather drown in a creek than to submit to slavery. Which, you know, that oh, that's a that's a pretty harsh reality. But if you look at like World War II, how they had you know in Saipan, how the people were jumping off the cliffs because they didn't want to be enslaved by the Americans. And I have no fear, I'm back. Yay! Um, uh, oh, fuck this! Get the part. I'll get. I'll get. It'll get a little bit better. Trust me. I didn't know how to structure this first part here. So I'm just kind of like quoting some things and um, carry on. You're doing good. You know, I really don't know. There's not a whole lot on like who these quotes came from. Oh, shit. You done fucked up. Done fucked up, A.A. So Ron. Here's a, here's a really good quote. And uh, this is from the Encyclopedia of African History and Culture. And it says, quote, to repress and control slave rebellion, especially in those places such as South Carolina and the Caribbean islands, where persons, where persons of slavery outnumbered the free, sometimes ten to one, Africans were forbidden to meet in groups or to learn to read, and they lived under constant scrutiny of their overseers. Families were often separated, further increasing their isolation from one another and from white society. So, I'm just going to interject here. So, <clears throat> uh, everybody knows we've been to Saipan. Everybody doesn't know I went on a mission trip to Saint Croix. And it was a Dutch island at one point. And uh, we're working on these houses. My wife went along. uh, Our uncle went along. And uh, you would go to these houses. And, like, the people who own the house would tell you, oh, these used to be slave quarters. Mm -hmm. So we're down there. And I'm thinking there's going to be a lot of agriculture there because they got to kind of fend for themselves. Uh, I, I expected to see because Captain Morgan is made down there. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> what, what was the other rum that's made down there? Oh, uh, okay. So Kuzan rum is made down there, and you could tour both of those places. I expected to see like sugarcane fields everywhere, but you don't see them. Hmm. And I was talking to the one lady. Now the one lady was from there, moved to New York, lived in New York for many years, went back. Nice lady, uh, her granddaughter, 
uh, was cool. Like, like the, the whole family was cool. Uh, she was telling us that, like, nobody wants to get into agriculture because it brings up, and, and too many recent hard feelings of slavery mm -hmm. and, like, there's people still on the island that remember it. And, you know, yeah, man, it's kind of a big deal. It was, you know, just rampant. So when, when, uh, the Dutch were kicked off the island, like <clears> there was a lot of harsh feelings towards the Dutch. The, the last house we worked on was an, an old Dutch lady. And, uh, and she was really nice, had nothing to do with slavery. Uh, but even she said that, that, that she sometimes feels the prejudice against the Dutch because of what had happened in sure. the past there. And, uh, understandably, but. Well, sure. Well, I'll take a look at. Um, just white people in general. A lot of, you know, people that were affected, or still to this day affected by slavery, you know, oh, you fucking white privilege, da 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 And, <clears throat> I don't really want to get into this because I feel like it's a loaded question, but, you know, look at my family, did not come over to the States until 1910. That was when my first, my grand, great, great, great fucking grandfather Looked just like me, but less fat. And, um, <laughs> you know, they came from Europe. And, you know, they did. But I could see, yeah, would I be a little pissed off that, like, you know, everywhere you go, everything's segregated or, or, or you know, you just look down upon for being a different color. But here's my take, simple take without getting political because we don't do politics. Um, I will hold people accountable for their actions. I do not hold you accountable for your father's actions, your grandfather's actions. You are not your grandfather, or I'm not saying you in general. But right. What I what I guess what I'm trying to say is like a lot of people feel that like we reap the benefits of what they did. I, I know it's a loaded question. I don't really want to stay too long on this because I feel like. <laughs> I don't know what the right answer is, and, and I'm just going to move along. The right answer is judge people for them, not for um, their past. So I, I literally, what I did, I just fucking plagiarized this guy's whole entire fucking video. And I don't care, whatever. If this is, just gets out to more people, the more the merrier, because I think we should know about, like, I didn't learn any of this stuff in high school. I didn't learn any of this shit in college. They don't teach you this stuff, you know? And it's just kind of like forgotten about. Like, eh, that never happened. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's an ugly thing to look at. So people try to put it in the back of the cover so they don't yeah. have to deal with it. So, well, that's why I specifically wanted to focus on, like, like uprising. Because I'm like, man, there's no fucking way. There had to be an uprising. Like, you know, as a... As, if you had a group of people and they're like, we're just sick and tired of this shit, uh, I'm going to fucking get that log over there. I'm going to bust it upside your fucking head and burn your house down. Fuck you. I don't care if I die or, or whatever happens. Right. I'm not living this lifestyle anymore. Fuck you. But I think you could attest. I could see you just rising up and be like, I'm not going to take it no more. Uh, I'm done. I'd be the first one killed. So fucking pick your own cut, asshole. And, uh, so he kind of it goes in, in like, uh, numbers here. So I think you're going to like this number, too, because this is something I didn't fucking even realize that, that even happened. So we'll start with number 10. It was the first slave rebellion in the U.S. So the slave rebellion at San Miguel de Guadalupe in 1526. Uh, or, I'm sorry, in 1526, the settlement San Miguel de Guadalupe was founded by a Spanish explorer, Lucas Vasquez. <clears throat> it was the first European settlement in what would become the continental United States. Did they have tamales? Oh, God, I fucking love tamales. <laughs> you know what? You might be able to enslave me with some tamales. <laughs> you kept feeding me. <laughs> I'm like a goddamn goldfish. You think I'm going to eat this shit one more time? Ooh, tamale. <laughs> <clears throat> um... So it was first, it, uh, this was San Miguel de Guadalupe 
was the first European settlement in what would become the continental United States. Where was it? Easy there, Michael. I'm, jump ahead. I'm sorry. Though it is unsure where exactly the settlement was, it is thought to be either in Georgia or Jamestown, Virginia. Okay. The Africans brought there, who apparently, I guess they were, they, he said they were experienced slaves. So they have been slaves for a while. They're not just like fresh off the boat. So again, they're sick of this shit. So are you saying there was slavery someplace other than the United States? Of course. Oh, I did fucking uh, You would never know that if you listen to the media. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um so the Africans brought there, they refused to be enslaved. So Vasquez brought approximately a hundred enslaved from Spain. They rebelled with many escaping to many of the native population. And this is considered to be the first non native settlers in the population. So I guess they just said fuck it and ran away. So I, I it doesn't say if it was violent. Maybe it was. I'm sure a couple of people got hurt or killed. But then they said they they just assimilated into the into the native population and they were taken in. Like okay, cool. Well, and then apparently, I guess the the Native Americans on the East Coast were less violent than West Coast, right? Or the the middle the uh, Middle East. I'm trying to say, uh, you know, like the, the Lenape Indians and all around this area were more or less. They weren't more as warlike. Yeah, I guess that was what I'm trying to say. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they would go to war and fight, but. Not as aggressive. Yeah. Like, yeah, not raiding tribes and, you know, just killing motherfuckers because they, they, they want to. So the next one is, I think you're going to like this one, Mikey. Eight, the 1842 Slave Revolt. In the Cherokee Nation. So, unbeknownst to me, now, natives purchased enslaved and mistreated Africans. The Cherokee were one of the biggest perpetrators of this. And rebellion took place in Oklahoma on Indian Cherokee territory and was the largest group of escapees that occurred amongst the Cherokee. Did you know that? I knew that they enslaved, like, I don't, I, I, I don't know if that's what they called it. They enslaved members of other tribes. I did not know that they had African slaves. No, and they traded, and and, and so their their fucking hands are in this too. And on November fifteenth, eighteen forty two, a group of African slaves owned by the Cherokee escaped and tried to reach Mexico, where slavery slavery had been abolished in eighteen thirty six. Wow, I didn't know that either. Along the way, they were joined by 15 other slaves that were escaping from the, it just says the creek in Indian territory. So they must have been on the same notion and, and met up together. And they raided stores for food, ammo, guns, horses, mules. And uh, the Cherokee, along with the Choctaw Indians, massed a small little army and eventually caught up with them. All the slaves, all the slave escapees were rounded up and brought back successfully. Some were executed for the insurrection. The Cherokee Rebellion was, quote, the most spectacular act of rebellion against the Cherokee Nation. Uh, then we have the most famous U.S. slave rebellion, and that was uh, Nat Turner. Yeah, he, in that video I watched, he talked about that. Nat Turner's Rebellion, or a.k.a. the Southampton Insurrection. Yes. So, uh, little young Nat Turner said he was destined to show the world the magnificence of the human spirit. Driven by prophetic visions and a host of followers, Turner and about 70 armed enslaved men and free blacks set off to kill the white neighbors who enslaved them. In the early morning, they killed Turner's master, wife and children with axes. By the end of the next day, the enslaved army attacked about 15 homes and killed around 55 to 60 whites. As they moved toward, toward Turner's promised land, quote unquote, which he idealized through his religious vigor, the rebellion was famously put down, and Turner was eventually captured and killed. The way in which he used the rebellion of his 
since the way in which he used the religion of his enslavers to turn against them was nothing short of spectacular. So it was put down at Belmont, Belmont Plantation on August 23, 1831. And it says 51 of those who were killed were white. 55 to 65, just like you said, people were killed. So I guess they killed other slaves who were standing up for their masters. I mean, why would you do that? But uh, no, wait, what? It says fifty-five to sixty-five people were killed. Fifty, fifty-one were white. So if there were non-whites that were killed, there would have been other black slaves who stood up for their masters or yeah, protected maybe. their masters' home. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, here's another one. It's called the Stono Rebellion. Not the Stoner. Stono. Stono. The largest slave rebellion in the 13 colonies. Sunday, September 9th, 1739. About 20 slaves under leadership of a man named Jemmy provided his enslavers with a painful lesson on the African desire for freedom and liberty. The very founding... Uh, precepts of American identity. It is believed that many of the enslaved Africans were warriors from Angola and were highly trained in warfare. They gathered at the Stono River, executing the white store owners and putting their heads on the storefront steps so for all to see. South Carolina. Okay. <clears throat> so these guys weren't fucking around. No. And, um, they moved on burning houses and killing their owners, marching through the colonies towards St. Augustine, Florida, where under Spanish law, they would be free. Not all blacks joined the rebellion. Some hid their white masters. As they marched toward Florida, they rec they reportedly shouted the, the word Lukongo, meaning liberty, in their native Angolan language. Although some did make it to Florida, most were killed by colonist troops. And, uh, I mean, you don't really see any kind of future in this. It's just pretty much fuck you, we're going to kill you, and then they get killed. Which, yeah. I mean, what would you rather do? I'd rather fight than submit. Fight than submit, yeah. <clears throat> Left your smileys in it for me. The big cock. Uh, here we go. Now, I think I think these ones start getting further and further away from being actually on American soil. So, um, but this one is pretty interesting. I guess these guys were slated to come to the States, but anyways. The First Maroon War, Jamaica. Conflict between the Jamaican Maroons and the colonial British authorities started around 1728 and continued until peace treaties of 1739 and 1740. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the first successful slave rebellions in the Caribbean islands in 1655. Okay, this the, the the video that I watched. The guy talked about this. Yeah, this one's interesting to me. It, it is because they they in in uh, Jamaica they outnumbered their masters like ten or fifteen to one. Yeah, like. It, it, they had a good chance of succeeding, and they did. Yes, they did. Absolutely did. So, um, in, in 1655, the Brits defeated the Spanish colonists and took control of most of the island. After the Spanish fled, Africans escaped to the mountains and created maroon communities. The British could not get a stronghold on the maroon communities they were and they were constantly halted by Maroon ambitions. The Brits decided they cannot defeat the Maroons, so they came to an agreement with them. And one of the greatest leaders in the Maroon community is a woman they called Queen, Mar Queen Nanny. And she was born of the Shanti people and escaped slavery, starting a Maroon community in the mountains. Some call her the o Obia woman. Obia largely deriving from traditional 
African spiritual beliefs from Ghana. Following some armed confrontations with the British, Queen Nanny and her Maroons were able to maintain their sovereignty. Because of this history, she is a national hero of Jamaica, and being descendant of the uh, Maroon is looked upon as high honor with Jamaican culture. I wish I would have known that when I went there. Um, I just I'd like to know that the history of a yeah culture for you know the country. Well, that's what's there. interesting about the the mission trips. Like uh, when we went to to Saint Croix. Uh, some of the people there were very open about talking. I like to hear their story. I like to hear their personal story. Uh, the reason why we're there is we're, bu- we're building homes that were devastated by a hurricane. Um, like when we went to Saipan, we were building rebuilding homes that were devastated by typhoons. And uh, you know from talking to Eric, um, you know he, he told his story on how terrifying it was for yeah. for him and for the kids and. You know, I, I still keep in contact with him now. Um, you know, we were in St. Croix. Uh, they were very open about telling the stories. And, and and they're not afraid of the history. They just don't want any part of it. Um, but uh, that highlighted part there says... Uh, Nanny and her people now reside with her and her heirs, a certain parcel of land containing hundreds of acres in the parish of Portland. Is that in the States? No. It's in Portland, Jamaica. Okay. So, again, not necessarily a U.S. Right. rebellion, but I would figure that they were probably going to be sent here. Well, U.S. and Caribbean, you, you did say that up front. Yeah. Um <clears throat> So, here here's probably my, I don't even say favorite one, but most interesting one to me. Only because uh, I think there was like a, a, a lot more information on this one. But this was the 1811 slave revolt uh, of New Orleans, a.k.a. the German Coast Uprising. Uh, he par- talked about this one in his video. Yeah. yeah, apparently this one again is the largest slave revolt. I think they're all the largest slave revolt. So, um, anyways, it doesn't matter about size, about the motion in the ocean, baby. <clears throat> Eighteen eleven. Yeah, uh, this one was particularly very brutal, and uh, here I have some quotes here. I think there's a. I watched a video where there's, I guess they do a, a march, a reenactment march every year on this. Okay. And it's really cool. I, I would love to go down there and, and, you know, see this. I don't know if I could be a part of it, but that was some, one of my, I don't know, lifelong dreams or whatever. Well, I always wanted to be a reenactor. I, I just thought it's cool. Yeah, you're not going to fit in the uniform. I could be like a cook or something, you know? Uh, so, uh, some lady quoted the horses trot to the beat of revolution. And, uh, I guess this is another quote from, the hell is that? There's my phone ringing. No. Oh. I was going to answer it the way I answer spam calls. Oh. Did you ever hear me answer a spam call? No. I can answer Pennsylvania State Police, Broad Division, Trooper Ross, I speaking. <laughs> That's good. When I was, backstory, when I was in school, there used to be a state trooper who'd come and do a safety thing every year, and it was Trooper Ross, I. Okay. And Trooper Ross, I came to our school every day. They even had a song when he came in that, that all the students would sing. Here comes Trooper Ross, I. Here comes Trooper Ross, I. And everybody would be chanting this when he walked out on stage. It was like uh, when I was the, the when the school I don't know what they call them psychologist the yeah they're a rapist whatever uh, she would come she always did a, a program for the school and she had a little dolphin puppet and it was do so. And you'd have to sing, hey, do so, come on out. Hey, do so. 
Don't do so. I don't want to suck it. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> do so. <laughs> Why do you got to make fucking poor do so? <laughs> poor do so. I was more like poor Mike. I'm going to look it up. There it is. Do so the dolphin. There he is. Look at the wiener on that thing. There, oh. Hey, do so. Come on out. Oh, my God. That is that. There's something underlying there. Next thing you know, your fucking therapist is whipping his wiener out. Stop. Yeah, this is Duso's little best friend. Ah! Anyways. Ah. <clears throat> January 1811. Rose, an active rebellion. Where, where, where was this, by the way? Uh, uh, New Orleans. New Orleans. Rose, an active rebellion. Against what the fuck? This is like your notes here, buddy. You took them, not me. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. This is the 1811. Yeah, so. yeah. Yep. So, in January 1811, rose an active rebellion against their masters. Five hundred slaves, just up the coast from New Orleans, fertile grounds. This was a highly organized, premeditated challenge to the slave owner class. Its leaders had a clear objective, to capture the city of New Orleans and establish a free black republic on the banks of the Mississippi. Yeah, that'd be fucking awesome if they fucking did that. So, uh, Charles de Long, who reported to Manuel and Andre, a sadistic fuck, slave driver on the Woodland Plantation. So Charles DeLong, he, he he's under the command of Manuel Andre. I think he's a Spanish dickhead. And um, so Charles DeLong, he was a slave driver on the Woodland Plantation, wielded out punishments, made schedules, but it was all an act. DeLong despised the slave owner class. In the autumn months, two others got to know the real Charles DeLong, and their names were Cook and Kaman. So DeLong told them about how the slaves of Haiti had risen up 20 years ago and slaughtered their masters and created an independent black state. These three men set out about carefully fermenting rebellion. On January 8th, Governor Claiborne sent most of his troops to Baton Rouge to secure the American annexa annexation of Spanish West Florida. So we remember Spanish West Florida was not. If they got there, they would be free. Right. Uh, did they, I guess they abolished slavery. And um, <clears throat> New Orleans was particularly defenseless. So he sent all his troops down for this annexation and left the New, uh, New Orleans undefended. And that's when they decided to, all right, now we're going to strike. Uh, DeLong tries to kill Andre, wounding him severely. Andre flees across the river to another master's house. Charles. Paris. Andre tells him his slaves are revolting. Andre's son was then Andre's son was hacked to death. So actually, I didn't write this down, but what had happened was what had happened was I guess uh, as they were coming up to Andre's house, Cook went around the back and ambushed him. I think this is the one. I hope I'm. I'm... <laughs> oh, I don't want to get too ahead here. This might have been. Yeah, I think this was. It. Uh, Cook went around the back of the house, came in, and came out on the... No, no, this isn't it. Ugh, Jesus. I'm, uh... Motherfuck, hold on. You're a motherfuck? I apologize. You might have to pause this and edit this shit out. No, I'm not pausing nothing. Your notes? Ah, here it is, okay. So, is this as it? Andre fled... Is this um, it? We're back on, we're back online. Okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I think, uh, it doesn't say how he wounded him. I think maybe he fucking lopped his arm off or something. So Andre flees across the river to another master's house, Charles Perry. Andre tells him the slaves are revolting. And Andre's son was hacked to death at, at the house. So his fucking douchebag leaves his family behind to get slaughtered. You know, 
Um, quote, on to New Orleans, quote, freedom or death, were the cries as they marched down the levee. About 500 strong, they grew with a, they grew within a day. Uh, scared a lot of white planters, scared a lot of white planters fled, but not every plantation owner took the threat seriously. Here's the one I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, side note, Francois Trepanier, a notorious slave owner, didn't take the threat seriously, though told, though told by his slaves that he should hide. You might want to hide, bruh. Bruh. Just saying. But you might get the cellar. Um, he said, defiant, he sat out on his front porch with his shotgun. Hmm. He saw the passy go by his house, and he starts firing at him. But he's got a shotgun, so he didn't hit anything. <laughs> and uh, the, the posse ambushed him. This is when Cook went around the back of the house, goes in the back door, comes out on the front porch, and buries his fucking hatchet in the dude's head and kills him. Uh, and he also kills his son. In the early morning, the silence was was uh, shattered by horsemen thundering through the the Vukare. I don't know what that means. I think it's like an area down there, but it sounds cool. Vukare. I'm sure you're not pronouncing that right. The Vukare. I'm pretty sure you're not pronouncing that right. No, it's spelled it's spelled right. Vukare. Shouting the news, refugees poured <gasps> into the city, telling the. Oh, God, I can't read for shit. Telling Not just the, me today. <laughs> telling the stories of murder and mayhem. The white population began to, the white population began to panic. Governor Claiborne immediately issued a curfew of 6 p.m. for black people in the city. Then he ordered all the bars in the city and suburbs to be closed. Now, when did, did, why is it always the first thing to close the bars? Like, uh, well, here's what I find interesting. The guy says, then he did the unthinkable. He closed all the bars in town. But if you think about it, like, when you get a little liquor up in you, woo-woo! You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I could be his ass. Little boot, scoot, boot! <laughs> uh, so, again, Claiborne is the governor who sent all the troops down to Florida. And... Now he's backpedaling. He's trying to close everything. Oh, fuck, they're all revolting. Son of a bitch. So what I got on this one is they. it, it took. It was two days. Yeah, it wasn't long. It was two days. Yeah. They marched 20 miles. They burned five plantations. Three were burnt completely to the ground. And several slaughterhouses. And they were burning crops. Yeah. Uh, Claiborne, Governor Claiborne sc- scraped together... 30 regulars, and two companies of volunteer volunteer militia, a force of about 100 men against a slave army, five times their number. Under the command of General Wade Hampton, the Americans marched along the Mississippi. Along the way, they picked up uh, fleeing planters. I, what does that mean? Fleeing, like, I guess, crop owners? A.K.A. masters. Oh. I answered my question. So they're amassing people. People are going, oh, yeah, but I would do, no, get them all. Get them all picked for my shotgun. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. So after dark, they met at the Keener and Henderson Plantation, the spot where the airport stands today. Excuse me. Now, this is, this is, this is DeLong's army. Or, uh, oh, I, I, um, I lied. I digress. I'm sorry. I guess the, uh, slave owners and Claymore's army amassed at the Henderson Plantation, the spot where the airport stands today. Hampton laid an ambush and attacked, but the slave army had retrieved hours earlier, led by DeLong. Now, they said that this was an old tactic when, when the, I guess, from either the French or Haitians, when they knew they were going to be attacked, they would just flee until they had a better, better okay. fighting, you know, better odds were against or were for them. <laughs> kind of makes sense. Yeah. Let's uh, not stand here and just get slaughtered. 
So Manuel Andre, remember this guy that got severely wounded, his kid got killed, ran across the river. Yep. Uh, and his militia crossed the Mississippi and stumbled upon the rear of the DeLong's army. Within minutes, the slaves were out of ammo and beaten back by Andre and eventually taken out by Hampton and Andre. They only took 25 prisoners. 500. Jesus. <clears throat> um, and well, more, more, more than 500. And amongst these prisoners were Cook and Kumana, which were number two and three along next to DeLong. So they were the three top heads in this whole deal. After two days in the swamps, for the revenge of the killing of his son Andre, he had DeLong's arms cut off, shot him, and he threw him in a fire. When Cook was asked if he killed Francois Tripp with an axe, he freely and proudly admitted to the murder. Yeah, motherfucker, I did it. <laughs> I buried that hatch right now, white bitch's head. Not do it again. Uh, to make an example, 100 plus slaves were decapitated and their heads stuck on pikes for 40 miles from the Woodland Plantation to the Place de Arms in the French Quarter, today known as Jackson Square. That's Damn. fucked up. I mean, you don't think of shit like that happening in the States. That's yeah. like some medieval fucking crap right there. Yeah, I know. The heads on the spikes. Yeah. That's some Vlad the Impaler shit. I mean, it, it's just fucking sickening how how violent and, and just disgusting human nature can be. You know? Very true. And I This is all I got. There's more. I wanted to talk about uh, Free State of Jones. That was the movie I we recommended to my dad. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. And apparently that has some truth to it. Uh, that's a really good fucking movie. I like that movie. It was. And uh, well, you know more about that. Why don't you touch on that movie? Um, if anybody hasn't seen it, uh, Free State of Jones, Matthew McConaughey uh, played a great part. He was... Um, It was after slavery was abolished, uh, and what they were doing was, and I guess uh, the blacks had been given a right to vote, and what they would do is when they came in to vote, they would intimidate them, so they would just stay away from the polls, they wouldn't vote, but because they all knew if, if, if all the former slaves came out and voted in mass, that th their, their people wouldn't win, the Democrats wouldn't win. And uh, so uh, this white guy who had uh, a farm and everybody on the farm, it was like, I don't know, like a commune almost, where everybody on the farm, you worked, you worked the land, you reaped what you worked. Whether you were black, white, it didn't right. matter. And that was the thing because uh, it showed like the Confederate troops coming in and they would just take all your food. And that's what they were using to supply their guys. And so you would, you have a family of four, and guess what? They just took your fucking year's crops. And they were taking all kinds of shit, too. Well, the story was based in the 50s, and what it was was a guy went to court to get a marriage license. And because uh, his ancestry was, he had uh, black ancestry, but he was a white guy. Um, he couldn't marry in whatever state it was in because it was a mixed marriage and it was illegal. So they took him to court and they were charging him with the crime of being a black man trying to marry a white woman. Yeah. And the, the court case flashes back in history to Matthew McConaughey's time. And, uh, basically Matthew McConaughey had his second wife was uh, a former black slave. And they had a child, and the child looked white. But that was this this guy's ancestor. Eventually, they didn't incarcerate him, the guy, but they had to go to another state to get married. Right. And their married marriage wasn't recognized <clears throat> in whatever state they were in. And I wish I could remember what state it was, because what a bunch of backward fucks! Yeah, in, in you know, in, in more modern times, to 
Yeah, I don't know. That that just that kind of hatred and racism. I just I got no, I got no time or place for it. Ain't nobody got time for that. But uh, yeah, the movie is basically he was uh fighting for the Confederates in the Civil War. I guess his son gets shot. He tries to save them, and they do not they're like not having any of that. Take him to the tent. They're like officers only, you know. So he lays him down on the tree. Kid dies. He's sick and tired of the fucking war. He runs away. He comes a uh, a wall, a runaway. What did they call him? A wall. Uh, deserter. A, deserter. Yes, thank you. And then, as he's at his home with his wife and all his neighbors. These Confederates keep coming in, stealing their shit. So he stands up against them. Um, he has like a mock army. Not army, but like... They took the kids and they were sticking broom poles out the window. It made it look like there was like yeah, 10 like or 15 the, yeah. armed people. And they took their shit back from the... the I think they end up burning that farm down. Yes. And he retreats to the woods. He and... retreats to the woods and he starts an armed insurrection... With other black slaves in the swamps of, I'm mean, going to assume it's a Mississippi, Alabama, somewhere down there. Alabama, Louisiana. <clears throat> Louisiana. And um, they all take up arms and they start fighting back and killing uh, killing the, 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 the Confederate soldiers. And it's definitely worth a watch. It's a great movie. <clears throat> what was his name? Newton Knight. Newton Knight, yeah. And his second wife, Rachel. <clears throat> and then, you know, I... Mississippi. Was, Mississippi, okay. So he goes on to... You know, and, you know, from what we just read, you can pretty much guess what the outcome of that insurrection was. Didn't bode well for... No, it's the uh, rebels or the. Um, it says Knight launched an uprising that led Jones County, Mississippi, to secede from the Confederacy, creating the Free State of Jones. But this, this is the one thing that pisses me off. Here's a guy who just wants to be left alone, and wants to be able to just not be a bigot. Till your land, and you know what's yours is yours. What you put in the ground, that's what you get. Nobody else. That's your hard work. That's your money. And they fucking can't be left alone. There's always some fucking asshole. So, uh, I mean, I, you know, now that I got into this, I want to, <laughs> I feel like I kind of did this a little bit of injustice. Might have to do a, a second part to this. We find more information, but it's just so, I kind of hastily put this together. And, uh, but there's a lot of good information in here. Yeah. And it, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to say heartwarming to see. It's good to see that there were people who stepped up and didn't accept a shitty hand that was dealt to them of people treating them subhuman. Yeah. You know, nobody should be treated like that. I don't care. I don't care who you are, where you're from, what you're, religious beliefs are what your political beliefs are nobody deserves to be treated the way people have been treated it's just it's just not right now there's there's not a fiber in my being that says there's anything good about that anything right about that if if that's how you treat people you're a fucking piece of shit don't listen to our show because i got no time for you yeah second that That's a far cry from the uh, culture we have today where everybody's offended by everything. You know, these people had right to be offended because they were treated poorly, inhumanely. You know, the, the people who are offended today, well, you said the wrong word to them. You said manhole instead of sewer hole cover. You know, and that, you know, eat a dick. <laughs> if if the sole 
hurt in your life as someone saying manhole or breastfeeding, then or nipple, yeah, or nipple. We're not allowed to say nipple anymore. That's a plumbing term, by the way. A threaded pipe end. Gas cock. Can't say gas cock. So, anyway, so we we briefly touched on uh, slavery uprising, slave rebellions. Yeah, um, I, I like this. Now you were gonna you got, you got to see La Amistad. Yeah, I'll definitely give that a check. Uh, I don't know what was that. Um, I don't know if it was another movie. I could see the cover of it. It was. Uh, I guess he would he, he would have been a runaway slave, and it was a recent movie in the past couple of years. The guy in New York, or he went up to to uh, New England. Yeah, what was that? Uh, I, I watched that movie. I don't know if that really necessarily deals he, with he was uh, He was a freed slave, and he was making his way north, and they someone recaptured him and made him a slave again. Well, here's the other fucked up thing that I didn't really even you know think about, is that once the slaves were freed, they still didn't have anywhere to go. It's like, you know, it's like, okay, well, and... They said all their protection was gone because they valued a slave as a piece of property. You know, I spent such X amount of dollars on this man, woman, child. That's my property. You can't touch them. So they said a lot of that, like they were just getting killed because they had no protection from their, their owners. So a double. 12 fucking, years of slave. Yeah. That was the name of the movie. One, yeah. So that's that's like a, a double fucking whammy. Okay, you get you get released from your fucking master. No, you know what it was? He lived up north. Is this Cold Mountain? No, well, not down. No, twelve years of slave. He he lived up north. He traveled someplace, <clears throat> was captured and enslaved for twelve years, and then escaped and got back, I think, up north. I think. You know, I was getting back to the free state of Jones. The one, the one scene that really hits home for me. It's like sad, very, really sad. Is um, what? What was his name? Um, uh, there were Newton, Newton Knight, Newton Knight, Moses. H- yes, his his pretty much his best friend Moses. He's going out and he's getting the registry and he's writing down, you know, all the people who live in that town. For voting. For voting. Oh, yeah. And he's walking down the road yep. and these clan of white guys come after him and they don't show it. But what they show is Newton Knight walking down the road. Oh, no, he went to his house and he's like, where's where's Moses? And his wife's like, oh, no, no, I haven't seen him for a while. And he's like, fuck, I know something's up. And. He finds him, and all you see is his feet dangling from a tree. His pants are down around his ankles, and there's blood all over his pants. So he, they, what they call that, masticating? Is that what that is? Or, or mutilating? I think they cut his, yeah, cut his stuff off. And uh, now, yeah, now I'm afraid you're you're afraid to say junk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to be more serious. Do so was just face fucking you, <laughs> and now all of a sudden. <laughs> But then, you know, it, it's just a powerful fucking scene. And Matthew McConaughey, like, grabs his freaking his legs and... Yelling know, for help. And yelling for help. And he's snot yeah. bubbles coming out and shit. And it's just like... That's, like, gut-wrenching to me. Like, you know, it's... <clears throat> and all he was trying to do was give people a voice. Yeah, he was killed for no fucking... He, he wasn't being violent. He wasn't He wasn't doing anything other than giving people a voice. It's worth... The movie's worth... What's, uh, 12 Years a Slave is worth a watch, too. Did you see it? I've seen it, yes. Okay, I didn't see it. Yes, I watched it. I know when it first came out, it was like, whoa, this is you know, highly anticipated. But I would also like to see the, uh, I think it's in D.C. It's a, not a museum, but it's like some big, I don't know a museum. We were talking about this on another episode. And it, 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 there's a big memorial there. and It's really cool. Just the artist that did it, it was it's I can't fucking describe it. I can see it in my head, but I can't describe it. And uh <coughs> Yeah, just a fucking sad part of history and But uh, if if you don't face it, if you don't acknowledge it, you're bound to repeat it. Yeah. 
if if you see it for what it is as a horrible, awful thing, well, is disgusting? There some shit like that going on in China now with the the, the what the hell the, the wee people or something? I don't know. I I know when we were in Saipan. You, did anybody know we were in Saipan? Uh, no, I didn't know that. When we were in Saipan, uh, we went to the one. It was the the last Japanese uh, stronghold. And there were these tarps on the ground. Oh, yeah, like yeah, banners. yeah. That's right, yeah. And basically, I can't read Chinese, but from the pictures, it was talking about, and there was a lot of Chinese tourists there, and since they can't speak out in China, they were doing it there. They lay them on the ground, and they were talking about how uh, people are being stolen or uh, incarcerated for their body parts, yeah. their organs. Har- harvesting their organs on the black market. And... uh it, it was calling out that travesty of humanity, but it happens in China. Now we're going to be banned in China forever. Damn. And all our Chinese listeners, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we took on slave rebellions and uh, take it to heart. Think about it. Look it up. Research it yourself. And take on the world. Hold on to that. Welcome back to the shit show 2.0. Okay, boomer. Damn millennials. Wow. <laughs> Did not know that. Even flirters who who are obviously mentally ill. You want to be my wife? Oh, this is going to go downhill real quick. Our podcasts exist because of listeners like you. To find other great shows, head over to the den.show. Thanks for listening.